Welcome to Baseball Biz. This is Mark Carpenter, your host, and today we have a very special episode with an interview with none other than Bruce Vogue, the minor league geek. Bruce is also host of Just Barely Sports Podcast. If you haven't checked it out now, you should. You'll find him on Apple iTunes and also on Google Podcasts. Does a great job of covering a lot of things with baseball, everything from uh, like he kind of nails things down to the minor leagues. I uh, saw the thing on the Binghamton Ponies and some other trash can pandas. We can talk oh, yeah. about that later. So, Bruce, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for having me. I try to explain Just Barely Sports as this. It's not a sports show, but it's not not a sports show. Um, it's sort of everything that kind of fits in the middle of the cracks that's not like players on the field. So it can be, for instance, uh, we're about to do an episode about the video game NBA Jam. Wow. Um, which for a lot of people that didn't like sports and didn't like sports games, if you were a kid in the 90s, you still played NBA Jam, even if you had no desire to involve yourself with the NBA at all. As a matter of fact, I interview uh, the author of NBA Jam, the book, and he and I both had the same experience of not really being an NBA fan and then playing NBA Jam and getting into the NBA at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I like how one evolves into the other with that. The game itself brought you into into the uh... mm-hmm into the sport. So that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm glad about that. And another thing I know some of the other ones you've done too is like a focus on the logos and some of the marketing that they yes. do. So that's very That's cool what well. got me into all of this was that what I loved, and I think that those of you out here listening, you're probably uh, very much baseball fans. So take this trip with me for just a second, is that a young man uh, at the age of like 11 realizes he can throw like a 53 mile an hour curveball. And everyone tells him how amazing he is. And then he has to go through the ranks and get stronger. And he misses uh, dates so that he can throw a decent fork ball. And then he's the best in his high school. And he goes to the college program. He's the best in the college program. He gets drafted to a team. He's like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to make the show. And then they make him play in Montgomery, Alabama, in a, uh, wearing a hat that is a, a biscuit with googly eyes and a butter pat mouth. And that fascinated me. Great aspirations, man. <laughs> and there you well, go. That's what drew me because, like, uh, you know, the, the logos on the hats were a lot of minor league teams. They figured out if you made a cool logo, you don't have to play baseball. And there's something about the marketing mind that I have that I just thought that was great. Uh, so that's what I really latched on to. And from there, that's how I ended up with the show. I was a public address announcer for the Hagerstown Suns. Um, I was almost the public address announcer for the Baltimore Orioles. Wow. Um, I was invited to try out, and I failed, but I was invited to try out for the Philadelphia 76ers, uh, which was a super cool experience. And I was a uh, top eight for Cal Ripken's team, the Aberdeen Ironbirds. Oh, so my God. So I got to do a whole bunch of, like, announcing stuff. But what got me into it was not that I care about the play on the field. It was that I loved the logos, and then I wanted to be the voice that welcomed, like, all the new kids that were going to be learning about the game or wanted to inform the scorekeepers as to what changes are being made. Like, I wanted to be that welcoming voice, and that's how I ended up kind of in all of the rest of it. Well, we're glad to be able to spend some time with you. You've achieved so much with that, and obviously that growth into the game. And it's it's interesting, too, because you're covering minor league baseball. I mean, you've yep. been involved with it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's very interesting, you know, now that you're covering in this particular episode, your most recent one, is about the business of minor league baseball. You know, you were talking about the aspirations or talking about somebody who's done so much only to wear that hat with a special logo on it. But all those hours, those young people put into it. And I don't think most people understand what the commitment they've made to this game. You know, we're looking at guys in the rookie leagues who aren't going to make three, four thousand dollars for uh, the time that are going to be playing for three months. There's no money given to them for the time that they're in spring training or anything else. And we'll talk a little bit too about how, how we cut them so they don't even get paid for overtime. <laughs> oh yeah. It, it's, it's gross. I mean, to be real honest, like, because I came in, so I was working for the Hagerstown Suns um, and I was driving from Baltimore to be the announcer for Hagerstown. Now, if you know where that is, that's going to make sense to you. If not, that's about a 65 mile an hour trip one way. So I was driving about 130 miles a round trip to do these games. Wow. And I would show up and these poor kids, man, like it, there would be Bryce Harper and like Bryce Harper would be in a pickup truck 
jacked up on rims uh, with practically like hundred dollar bills shooting out of the exhaust. Everybody else would be four people in like a Pinto hoping that they can like get from the stadium to whatever room they have that's in the community that is not, it's not a hotel room. It's not their house. It's like they stay in a room of somebody's house in the community because that's how much money is available to pay these guys. If you're not a number one signing bonus, um, it is way, way crazy the way the pay scale works. Um, one thing I'll note, uh, just because I think this really shows the, the, the difference, the disparity between the major leagues and the minor leagues, is the minor leagues do two things. They're the, you know, the old school farm program. You grow them on the farm. And then they're also injury rehabs. So when like a major league, and not even like a high level major league, like a, a decent bench warmer major league player would come through and do an injury rehab, they would do things like leave 50 bats there because these kids couldn't afford bats if they broke them, um, which blew my mind. At one point, I want to say maybe Rick Ankeel uh, came into town because I worked in the, in the national system and Rick Ankeel was there. And that was one of the things was all the players were joyous because Rick Ankeel told Louisville Slugger he accidentally broke like 29 bats. <laughs> And they were like, how do you get away with that? And he was like, well, you know, I kind of wink and they kind of wink and then they hand me 29 bats and you guys can all have bats. So you don't need to worry about if something breaks it, you're going to have to to deal with it or explain it to the team or anything like that. So like, that's the difference is that if you're at that major league level, you're giving away 29 bats Louisville Slugger gives you. If you're at the bottom level, you're just hoping you don't have to pay 75 more dollars for another Louisville Slugger. Well, and that's it, isn't it, really? I mean, the whole idea is being at that minor league level Man, you've got to ask for crumbs. And now, and now we're looking oh, yeah. at what's happening. Those, what, for 42 of those teams? Pardon me for just one second. I just want to mention for most of the people listening right now, if you don't know, there is 160 teams yep. in the minor leagues. And of those 160 teams, Major League Baseball, Mr. Rob Manfred decided to say, guess what, last October, 42 of you guys, you're gone. Shoot, bye. Don't want to see any more rookies, and I forget what the other one is right now. But both of those leagues are, or whatever, are, both of those are gone. We're going to tell you how you're going to do business from now on minor league baseball. We've got this thing called a PBA, Professional Baseball Agreement. I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and editorialize a little bit here and say I don't think there's anything professional about it when one party comes in and says, "Hey, this is the way you're going to do it," and if you don't like it, we're going to walk away with all our toys and leave you behind. So minor league baseball. You know, you've been responsible for taking care of what? Your stadiums or your players? Which one? Well, we're going to – don't, we don't think you've been taking care of them at all. So I'm looking at you uh, as Major League Baseball. I'm looking at your facilities. I'm looking at you got these guys riding on buses and they're not making any money. Well, the money's supposed to be coming from Major League Baseball in the first place. Sorry, I'm getting up on my high horse about this. But when they came out last October and said 42 teams, you got to cut them. It's it's real weird. So let's let's like let's explain a couple things. I'll try not to go into the full episode. If you really want to have it all broken down, uh, go to just barely sports and check out the episode about the business of minor league baseball. But a couple like little things to let you know. So there's 160 teams in minor league baseball right now. M- Rob Manfred did say, hey, the entire rookie league is gone. The entire short season is gone. Um, so here's what we're gonna do: is hey, every major league club. We're going to let you, because so like, it's very easy to say that Major League Baseball's evil through this. They're really just creating efficiencies. It's just that sometimes in creating efficiencies, you're doing kind of evil things to places. So they've said to every Major League team, pick the four teams you want to work with, give them a license, and bam, that's what we're going to do. Now, the problem is, is you end up with states like West Virginia. West Virginia had four teams coming into this, and they may leave with one if they're lucky. Um, I want to say the state of Montana does not have, they are not a state that is bordered by a state that has a major league team. So they are losing all four of their teams. Uh, and part of kind of the illusion that we all do here is we all pretend, even though baseball's a business, it's the nation's pastime. And that's why it needs to be everywhere. There should be, we are going to keep putting baseball fields everywhere we possibly can because it's the nation's pastime. And that's great until you say, oh, but no, it's, it's also business. So Montana doesn't need to have any teams that look professional. And West Virginia, at one point, was going to have zero. I've heard they might keep one because they just built the stadium last season. So I think one of the 
oh goodness, maybe the pirates decided to keep a team out there. Um, but it's created this weird scramble now in the business side where minor league teams are like selling off part of their team to the major league parent for right. like a dollar, hoping that they'll be protected in this land grab. And then on top of that, if you are a major league team and you've decided that the team you really want is in unaffiliated baseball, why don't you grab them too? So that's why we, we contract from 160 to 120, but we actually have to lose 42 or 43 teams. Uh, because the St. Paul Saints are going to be picked up. The uh, Sugarland Skeeters are going to be put, picked up. And there is a possibility, depending on which article you read, that the Somerset Patriots are going to be picked up. And that's before, who knows? Maybe the Orioles decide they're going to go with another Eastern League team or something else changes. But, gad, Zooks, it's a weird land rush right now as everybody just tries to be one of the four affiliates that uh, that Major League Baseball will use. Well, it's it's interesting too when you're looking at the yeah the land grab. Uh, I kind of jumped ahead though. Some one of the things you and I talked off before we started recording mm -hmm. was how we got here. Looking at well America's pastime <laughs> and looking at the act that came up with that that kind of legislation we had, uh, which was anything but buried inside a bill with over a thousand pages deep. And lo and behold, that's where they were going to legislate and say, guess what? No overtime. Is that right? Yeah, so essentially, in 2016. Uh, Major League Baseball appealed to some Congress folks and said, hey, we want a thing called the Save America's Pastime Act. And well, what does that mean? Oh, well, we don't want to have to pay overtime to any of our players. So we just want a special exception written that says if you are a baseball player, you don't get paid overtime. So that came up. And it, I also want to make a note here because in the, in the episode I do, I'm a little political. But this, this, this had both a Republican and a Democrat sponsor. So it was not one party's fault. It was every party's fault. Two people put it up uh, in 2016. It got bad press. First, the Democrat, then eventually the Republican dropped off of it. They were like, oh, no, this is a hot potato we don't want. <laughs> okay, seemed great. Uh, Major League Baseball had a plan. They were like, I know what we're going to do. We'll get this passed. Let's try it again. So then they went to all the minor league baseball teams and said, hey, look, guys, gals, non-binary pals. Um, if you don't appeal your local Congress folks to get this passed, we will have to contract the league. So, for instance, if you are one of the great senators from Montana, they say to you, look, if we don't let this through and allow this time not only not to pay overtime, but to not even have to pay minimum wage anymore because of what all that overtime would represent, we just pay an amount, if we call it a 40-hour week, and they don't get any more. Uh, but senator from montana or senator from west virginia if we don't pass this we're going to lose all of our teams so you know montana and west virginia say well you know their facilities their your people have jobs that are there all the kids have jobs that are coming in there's tourism so i gotta factor all that in if what major league baseball feels like they need to run is my constituents are telling me i gotta get this thing passed gosh darn it let's save the nation's past and it ended up being buried I don't know. That was the one thing was I couldn't find the exact number, but it was just like deep in a bill. And because it was a spending bill, it was like in the thousand plus pages somewhere. It got buried in that the Save America's Pastime Act, where Major League Baseball does not track hours or pay overtime, uh, got passed. And remember, all these people, all these minor league teams worked to get this passed because they thought they were saving their team. Rob Manfred then a year later said, oh, whoops a daisy. Thank you so much for doing that for us. We are still contracting the league. Good luck. Yeah, a lot of love. A lot of love. But yeah. And and a lot of those folks, like you said, once it became a hot potato, people who were right on board there pushing us on through said, Oh my gosh, my constituency. Mm -hmm. And it was you were saying whether it was West West Virginia had had four teams and now West Virginia was one of the states. I think they get to keep one team. Wow. But they were doing it because they had four. And at one point in the discussions, they went from four to zero. I think they've saved one. Well, I'm glad to hear that much anyway. But it's it's just got to be a nasty little business at that point this point. I mean, I understand the economics of, you know, 160 teams. And I understand, you know, even if you look at the draft what we have in baseball compared to other sports, only a limited number of players are actually going to make it up to the show. There's 30 teams, and the rosters are limited. So what, what's going to happen? I, I understand that. But the thing that needs to be considered is community. And all those communities mm -hmm. which don't have a major league in their town, 
you know, they're in, they're tied into baseball, but they're also tied into that major league in some capacity. When they know that the guy they're seeing out there playing center field, who also does great at bat, they may see he, that person aspire. They may see him go up to Class A, Double AA, A, Triple A, and yes, then they're in the show. And the kind of excitement and history that builds for that town and for that team, that is something I don't think baseball realizes that is there. That is a marketing piece that is huge. And if I had that and you take it away from me, <laughs> uh, it's going to be a little hard. Well, and, and so that's part of what Major League Baseball is saying, is they don't even want to call this the contraction. They're saying, look, you have so many options. You're essentially, all we're doing is, is we're sure we're taking away players that might be future Boston Red Sox, but like you're getting equivalent caliber players from other places. And your options are one of three. One is become unaffiliated baseball. Now for me, Bruce Vogue, guy who cares about the sumo race mid-inning, that's fine. But for a lot of people, they want to see the, the future, exactly, that center fielder that's got a decent at-bat that eventually makes their way up to the show. That is important for a lot of people. So to say that they are the same is completely um, a lie, flat out. The other option you have is what's called college wood bat, which is even more gross in my opinion, because you're bringing college players in, and oh, wait a minute, the whole system of college sports is built, and we don't pay those people, even though they're working. So there you go. Here's a free team that hopes that one day a major league scout will see them and then bring them into affiliated baseball. Uh, the third option, of course, is to just stop being a team and fold. Those are your three options. Wood bat, where you kind of uh, work with uh, kids that can't do any better. Uh, unaffiliated, where you kind of hope maybe you have some players that will find their way to a team somehow, but it's still they're still not going to have that affiliation with the major league team. And then third one's against fold. Well, I think you hit it. I think that last one's going to happen a lot more than anybody wants to think about. Looking through what's happening in this world right now, this has become, well, nothing people really are going to consider. They've got a lot going on. I mean, whether it be the presidential race, it be the pandemic, whether it be, you know, uh, racial injustice, all these things that are going on. So guess mm -hmm. what? What you and I are talking about has really become inconsequential. Oh, but, definitely. But it's still part of the fiber of people of who we are above and beyond all those very issues that need to be addressed. This is something that what happens, I mean, it happens with a lot of these, Bruce. I mean, you look at this, how many times there is there a hot issue out there and the next issue through the news cycle gets lost. We've got championships right now with hockey, with basketball. Mm -hmm. We've got things going on with a bubble and coming up here with the playoffs for baseball. Nobody's looking, man. This is when people can, you know, go ahead and set the cards. They can move things around, and the rest of us won't see it. Oh, yeah. Pat O'Connor, MILB president, gone. He just resigned. And within the last couple of months, he was heading up with the negotiations. He had three separate negotiating teams that he's had working with Major League Baseball in just the last few months. That's crazy nuts insane. Now, again, none of this is going to be rising up to anybody's view until it, until that door closes, I'm afraid, because there's so much else going on. Oh, definitely. And since we're talking about the, the business of baseball here, let's talk about a couple things. One, when you talk about all those other, and I specifically want to talk about kind of all the injustices and the social stuff, minor league baseball finds its way to normalize those things that were not normalized. For instance... Um, I, it ended up getting canceled, so I didn't go, but the Columbus Clippers were going to do a drag queen softball game, uh, because the city of Columbus, uh, has like the second largest pride parade in the country. Um, so you even see these teams in these communities saying, these are the issues of the community. Let's bring them into a place where everybody meets together. Uh, no matter what your faith may be, no matter what your side of the aisle you're on, everybody kind of still comes to the baseball game. And why don't we take these things and, and see what we can do about putting everyone together? Because it'll be Drag Queen Baseball on uh, Thursday, but it'll be Faith Night on Sunday. So all of these things are coming to the same place to form this community. There is something to be said about minor league baseball being a community hub for these smaller cities. Additionally, uh, as we talk about COVID-19, uh, so... A lot of people are saying that what may end up happening is is that Major League Baseball may just wait to see who's still left standing. Uh -huh. Because remember, these teams are going to have not done anything for 19 months. 
And the worst of it is, because I had never thought about this. So the short season teams that got cut actually got the easiest ride because they didn't buy their food for the start of the season. So COVID-19 hit, you know, right at the beginning of the season. All of these teams that were supposed to play a full, like, 80-game season had already bought food for at least 40 games worth of, uh, of concessions. So they not only don't make a dollar, they had to outlay all the money on their season projections for, like, popcorn and hot dogs and ketchup. And, you know, you don't think about that. You're like, oh, ketchup. But at the end of the day, you know, 70 gallons of ketchup is going to end up being something to you when you can't bring one person into your stadium. I think you hit an ideal point, too, when you talk about community. You know, whether you were talking about re- reflecting as far as the Pride Parade mm-hmm. and then having the drag queen uh, with, excuse me, having drag queens there with the, with the community baseball team, yep. whether you're talking about, and it's interesting when you're talking about the food because what these small baseball teams are doing, they are part of that community. I'll go back to that mm-hmm. again. And they reflect that. So when they have all that food and everything else, you've seen some where they're donating it, where they're cooking it up and having people drive up to the parking lot and they're giving it to them, you know, to try to make use of the facilities. I was, I was even seeing some graduations being done on minor league baseball fields. Yep. Uh, a wedding and, and turning the baseball field into, <laughs> into a restaurant where you have plenty of room for social distancing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, on that and, and drive ins. I mean, like I said, all this together. So there's a, a lot of things that these teams have done to be a part of the community before and in these difficult times as well. So I have a great love for them just for that sort of thing. I said, whatever happens, I I feel like it may be inevitable at this point, but those teams should still exist as a local, just kind of have to adapt to the mindset that they're not going to necessarily be affiliated with MLB, this dream league that Manfred talks about. I would still enjoy seeing a team play there, even if they're not affiliated. But I, I feel that a lot of those, like you were saying, because of conditions being what they are today, mm-hmm. may just roll up and go home, that it may be done because people can't afford to, you know, the taxes, or whatever else on those stadiums when they haven't had a year of anybody mm-hmm. coming in there. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's all real. It's It's all very something. Because the thing to remember about baseball is, especially minor league baseball, is that Essentially, it is two forces that have decided to get together to make money, but aren't really attached. And that is you have the players, which are owned by the major league parents. And then you have a marketing team that pays for the stadium and the logos and the hats and the all that kind of stuff. So the marketing team is still doing everything they can to tr- just try to make some money to keep this thing afloat. And the marketing team will always do that. But at the end of the day, if what you wanted to do was bring your son and daughter to see the future Baltimore Orioles, there isn't enough marketing to make up for that. If that's the, the thing you want to be able to say, if you used to live in St. Louis and now you've moved out to the, to the deep bergs and you just want to be able to see Cardinals players come through, there's nothing that fixes that. You know, there's no amount of drag queen softball games and drive-in movie theaters and pro wrestling nights that's going to fix that. Um, I would hope that more people are like me and just kind of want to see the spectacle. But I understand that, you know, especially in the baseball world, that, that I'm a much smaller contingent than you may think. I mean, there's a lot of families that are up for wacky, reasonably priced entertainment. But some part of that often is either mom or dad has a love of Major League Baseball. And it's a way, if you're in Montana, to still feel connected to the conversation. And I think now, once those teams in like Montana disappear, what connection to the conversation does Montana have anymore? Well, that's it. It it has to be so localized, and you can't see it beyond just that minor league team. There's nothing to to go to the next. But I'd like to take a moment, though, and reflect on what you were saying about marketing. Because I love what you do as far as another part of your show, just on Just Barely Sports. First, I want to say, folks, if you haven't checked him out, please do check out Just Barely Sports. Bruce Vogue does a great job on there, and especially this one I was talking about what you did on the business of the minor leagues. But weekly, you also have the logo show on there as well, as, as sometimes as a feature. And I love because you talk about the marketing. And, yep. and I'll, t- I'll tell you one quick thing. I'm actually from Louisville, Kentucky originally. I live in Tampa now. Okay. And I, I loved you what you did with the uh, the Derby, the mint juleps. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I, I'd been to the Louisville uh, Redbirds game. She <laughs> Louisville bats they, now. They have Louisville bats now. Yeah, <laughs> Louisville bats. I went there a couple of years ago, 
and they did have, they were the mashers that night. They weren't yep. the bats. They were the mashers. Yep. And they had Evan Williams flights. So you walk mm-hmm. up there and they give you four <laughs> little mini shots of, of whiskey and you could go back and get more if you so chose. <laughs> but anyway. Because Louisville. It's Louisville. You know? yeah. Louisville. That's all you need to know. That is, and, and that actually demonstrates, like, one of the things I really love is, is that if you ever run across a minor league baseball hat and you don't understand it, the answer normally is, it's something super local. Just ask somebody <laughs> and they will explain it to you. Um, like if you listen to one for the Derby City Mint Juleps, the work that went into this hat in this logo, because it's like an anthropomorphic silver cup, which if you know about the Kentucky Derby, the most expensive mint julep is the bookmaker that's served <laughs> in, this, in this silver cup that's like a hundred dollars, but the ticket to get to the bar that serves it is like ten grand, and it's a hundred dollars to get this bookmaker's mint julep. And then if you look at the face, it's the nose is a um is a uh is a horseshoe that's turned right side up because that's good luck like there's all these things that are hidden in logos uh because minor league teams want to appeal to the people that are right there you got to sell to the locals that are within 30 miles and you do that by just being as local as you possibly can and that's why for instance uh formerly the redbirds they've been the louisville bats the louisville river bats went back to the louisville bats stayed the louisville bats I think for a little while, they were a vampire bat. Yeah. Then they became a vampire bat uh, where it was a baseball bat with wings. <laughs> then they went <laughs> back to being, uh, then they went to this symbol that almost looked like um, like a ripoff of the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, that was just kind of like a Batman, Baltimore Ravens thing. Then they went back to the wacky bat with the bat. Like, And these changes are just trying to figure out what the community wants and where they think their identity is. And the Mashers <laughs> was another one. Evan Williams sponsored that. And that logo was like a, a barrel <laughs> with a baseball bat. Yeah, a big and, old um, bag of mash. And he had a bag of he had a bag of sour mash over his shoulder. <laughs> yeah, it, it's crazy. But I mean, that's the color of it. You know, like you said, mm-hmm. I live down here in Tampa. I'm very fortunate because I have several minor league teams around here. You know, uh, the spring training, et cetera. And you've got everything from the Marauders. You've got some things as simple as like the the uh, Lakeland Tigers. And then mm-hmm. you've got the rays with the uh, the stone crabs right down the road too. So yep. it's it's exciting stuff. It's fun and it's community. And again, I want to thank you and with what you're doing with Just Barely Sports and how you're featuring a lot of those teams. You've been doing a bang up job, dude. And I'm definitely going to continue thank to follow. Thank you so much. So uh, and thank I, you. And I'm going to yeah. do just because you mentioned it. I'm going to do one more. So the the Lakeland Flying Tigers. They are called that because where they were playing, Joker Marching Stadium, was, before it became a minor league baseball stadium, it was a, I want to say, a World War I training barracks uh, in Florida. They converted the World War I training barracks into a baseball field. So the Flying Tiger is the Flying Tigers of the Air Force. That's exactly why they did it. And their hat is, um, it is like the Detroit Tiger in the middle with the wings to look like the like lapel pins that you see on an officer's uniform. They took it so far that uh, there's a special version of the hat they call, I think the, the scrambled eggs is what they refer to it if you're really in the know. But it's got like fronds on the brim of the hat. You can only wear that if you're a higher official. So only the team manager and the coaches are allowed to wear that hat because that's a higher ranking in the Air Force. Oh, wow. That, I mean, and that's how in-depth these logos get, and that's why we do Logo Show as a part of Just Barely Sports. I love it. I love the history that you're able to bring out of that. And as far as higher ranking, that's you too, dude. So you should, be, <laughs> you should have the epaulets to go with that too, you know, man. Oh, but uh, so <laughs> I want to thank you again. Again, talking with Mr. Bruce here, the minor league geek. And he is the host of Just Barely Sports, but he also you're on the, some game podcasts too. What are those? Yeah, no, I do a whole bunch of things. So I am. I also have a YouTube channel uh, called Board Game the Game Show, where I take uh, popular board games and I try to convert them into the game show format. Um, I also do some like interviews and some contests and some quizzes and stuff. And then I also am the moderator of a podcast called uh, the Party Game Cast, featuring the Party Game Cast. It is a podcast about party games and games you take to parties. So if you care about learning like what modern party games may be, like if back in the day you knew Jenga and categories and you kind of wonder like what's been made since the 80s that's the kind of stuff that we cover on that show 
Well, I'm glad, man. It's it's definitely needed these days in the pandemic, and I've tried mm-hmm. to do some games across even what's a Zoom call with family Absolutely. members. So well, that's and that's and that's what we're doing on the show now. We used to meet in my house in my studio and play party games and talk about them, and now we can't. So now we're literally covering stuff you can play over Zoom <laughs> uh, that's playable, where you can still have fun with a bunch of people and try to feel connected in these times. Wow. Well, again, thank you again, Bruce, for joining us today and talking with. Mr. Bruce Vogue, the minor league geek from Just Barely Sports Podcast. Again, check that out and everything else. And you can, you can also find him on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Bruce, man, you've, you've done a fantastic job walking through us uh, what's going on with some of the business of baseball and taking a look at some of the challenges they have. And hopefully there'll be there'll be some future for these teams, we hope. That should be seen soon. So thank you again, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, everybody out there. I'm sure this is a slightly longer episode than you're used to. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I genuinely appreciate it. Don't forget uh, Just Barely Sports. All right. Thanks again. And remember, you can find us on Baseball Biz on virtually every directory, whether it be iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, etc. Thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you again real soon. Special thank you also to X-Take RUX for providing us with this great intro and extra music rocking forward.